Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Hey there, everybody. How are you? It is great to be back in here and finding the time to uh, uh, do another podcast. This is podcast number 131. In this particular podcast, uh, I'm going to interview, I've got an interview I did earlier with Dr. David Hone, who is an incredible paleontologist who, who whose main focus of study is behavior of prehistoric animals which that's pretty that's pretty incredible in itself because you wouldn't suspect that um, uh, behavior is something we could really understand and yet he'll lay out uh, the formula that he uses and the scientific methods he uses to be able to uh, to give us some insight into things that that sometimes the fossils don't tell us you know I've said before, behavior doesn't fossilize, but in fact, it does. In fact, it does. Uh, I've been remiss all this time of saying that because uh, I didn't acknowledge that indeed there are some things that behavior or that fossils can tell us about behavior. To everybody who is listening on the podcast, uh, welcome. I hope you all have been doing well. To everybody who's watching the video version on YouTube, it's nice to, to see you guys again. Uh, for everybody who's watching, I've got to tell you, there is something behind me that has been creeping me out <laughs> for three solid days. It is a um, it is a hand puppet, a Dinosaur George hand puppet, something that uh, somebody made for me uh, several years ago. Gosh, this must have been at least, man, at least 15, maybe 16 years ago the sioux exhibit the the sioux the dinosaur named sioux that exhibit came to san antonio to the institute of texan cultures and the folks there were nice enough to ask me to be a part of it to kind of help um uh, promote it and and make it a, a more exciting venue and one of the people there was a puppeteer and he made this puppet of me <laughs> that he uses or used in shows and those, so they took my recorded voice off of a, a video that I had done and they included my voice in the puppet show and then they invited me to come watch it. And I was honored. Listen, I was honored. I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen that somebody was kind enough to do that. And it was really a lot of fun because this little puppet would come out. It was, it looked like me and uh, I used to wear a vest all the time. It wore the same vest. It had a little hat, my little glasses. And so it would walk out. And it would start talking, and of course, it would mouth the words that they had pulled out of the video. And the little kids went nuts. They would cheer and clap like it was the <laughs> the greatest thing they had ever seen. And I was so honored by it. Well, recently at the Institute, uh, they were cleaning out some things, and they found that puppet. And they went, hey, I bet George would like this puppet, which I do. I, I like it a lot. I'm, I'm honored. And so they brought it in and are they, 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 well, actually Cheryl, my director of events was nice enough to go by and pick the thing up. And then she brought it to me and I put it on my desk and I loved it. Well, it made its way in here and now it's <laughs> sitting behind me. And I've got to tell you, there have been some times that I have turned around and saw that thing staring at me and it absolutely mortified me to death because I don't like clowns. A lot of people know this. I don't like clowns. And or, or, let me take that back. I don't like people dressed up as evil clowns because saying I don't like clowns is not fair. There's a very good friend of mine who was actually a clown for Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. And clowns bring unama- unimaginable amounts of joy to people. And, you know, people dressed as clowns go to hospitals and they bring happiness and they joy. It's the people that dress up as evil clowns that I don't like that. That that creeps me out. Well, I also have this unusual fear of dolls. Only dolls that look real. Like if they look too real, it, it just, <laughs> I don't know why, but I just don't like them. So this little guy sitting behind me here, this little mini me, 
it is a lot of fun and I'm so appreciative of having it. But every now and then I turn around and it scares me half to death. All right, so been on the road a lot with the Traveling Museum. We've been all over the place. Uh, I've done a lot of a lot of fun uh, events. In fact, we leave tomorrow morning for one up in Frisco, Texas. Uh, that's up north of Dallas, Texas. So we're heading up there with the museum. But uh, so I haven't had time, of course, to be able to do a lot of these podcasts, and and so I'm I'm sorry that I haven't had the time to do them. But. Uh, I have a lot of time off in November and December, and so I'm scheduling a lot of interesting guests. One of the guests will be talking about um, some uh, uh, pachycephalosaurus skull that they found that shows evidence of injuries. So he's going to come on and he's going to tell us what they they hypothesize caused those injuries. That's going to be cool. But there's another one I'm really looking forward to as well, and this one is a fanged kangaroo. Yes, a kangaroo with fangs. I am so looking forward to that. So both of those will be coming up soon. So uh, uh, if you if you subscribe to my podcast, of course, you'll get information. And if you're watching this on uh, if you're watching this on Facebook and on um, uh, uh, um, 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 if you're watching this on Facebook, if you're watching this on YouTube, I hope that you'll consider uh, subscribing as well and liking it because all that stuff uh, hopes uh, helps a bunch. All right. When I come back, uh, I will do that interview that you'll hear with Doctor Hone. It's a very exciting interview. So hang around. I'm gonna br- I'm gonna come right back after this ad, and I'll play his interview. Bring Dinosaur Georgia's traveling exhibit to your school, museum, or city. This is the largest exhibit of its kind in North America and will turn any facility into a natural history museum. You'll see things like prehistoric mammals, giant fish, ancient reptiles, and of course, dinosaurs. It's affordable, amazing, and will be an event you'll never forget. See complete details at dinosaurgeorge.com or call us toll free, 888-487-7478. Bring Dinosaur Georgia's traveling museum to your community today. All right, so this interview with Dr. Hone, I, I, I actually recorded yesterday, which was kind of neat. Uh, so I recorded it. So um, uh, what we talked about was animal behavior. And so let's, let's, play that, uh, let's play that interview. You know, there's so much discussion about the discovery or, the, or what they think may be the discovery of dinosaur DNA. And, and so many people are excited because they figure, well, this means that we're one step away from bringing extinct dinosaurs back to life. Well, I don't know if we're at a point in science where we can even hope that at this particular time may be possible in the future, but we don't have to bring an extinct dinosaur back to life to be able to understand how they behaved and what their environments are like, because we have paleontologists out there who do that work for society. And one of the best people, to be able to get some information about how dinosaurs may have lived and and maybe reproduced and interacted is Dr. David Hone from England. Dr. Hone, I'm so thrilled to have you with us. Welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much for having me. You bet. So before we get started, um, let, let's start off by m- maybe telling us a little bit about yourself, maybe some background as to who you are. Um, wow, that's a very broad question. Um, <laughs> I've, yeah, I'm a vertebrate paleontologist. I specialize in dinosaurs and pterosaurs, but I've worked on various other little things, um, including rhynchosaurs, early birds, and some other reptiles at various times. Um, and yeah, I guess uh, I really always wanted to be some kind of biologist. I'm, I think I'm unusual among a lot of my colleagues who are dinosaur researchers in that dinosaurs weren't the only thing for me as a kid. Um, any kind of animal at all I was interested in. Um, You know, I'd have been quite happy, I think, working on lions or fish or millipedes or pretty much anything else. I just wanted to be a biologist. Um, And and dinosaurs and saber-toothed cats and mammoths and trilobites were all part of that as well. Um, And basically through my career, I slowly drifted from um, looking at animal behavior and giraffes and fish in one area in particular and ended up working on dinosaur behavior. (laughs) But, you know, if you didn't have that understanding of how modern animals behave, how difficult would it have been for you to try to uh, try to understand how extinct animals behave? 
Yeah, so so I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Bristol in the UK. So I actually did a, a basically a straight zoology degree. But Bristol was and still is famous for its animal behaviour program, and that was a very big part of the reason that I went there. Um, so while obviously. Um, you know, that was 20 years ago now. Uh, it was a very major part of my education. Um, and I did every animal behavior course that I could. And I learned a lot from some very um, significant researchers. Um, one of my professors in his cut, he'll later wrote a paper with me on dinosaur behavior. And he's actually gone on to do a couple more dinosaur papers since, I think, as a result of me getting him into it. Um, but yeah, I, that was an area in which I knew an awful lot. So when I came into paleontology, uh, this is an area which, for me, was already a strength. Wow. Well, I, w- I want to get into into the, the focus in a moment, but I also want to talk about the teaching side of your career. Now, you're a, you're a lecturer in zoology at Queen Mary University there in London. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So what, between the research that you love and the teaching side, how do you find the time to do either Instead of just one, how, how can you do, how do you have the time to teach on top of all of your research? Yeah, um, evenings and weekends and holidays <laughs> is, is, is largely the answer, to be honest. Um, I, do, I do. I mean, my my academic job is is primarily as a, as a teacher on the teaching side of things. Um, so I, although I do my research, it's a bit of a... I was going to say hobby almost, which that isn't quite true, but it's, I have less time for it, let's say, than some of my colleagues because of the way my contract is set up. Um, so getting stuff out there is a little tougher for me. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a question, sadly, of <laughs> putting the hours in. <laughs> you know, That's I, how I get it done. I, I laugh when, when people, when I hear people talk about, oh, I can't wait for Friday because I'm off the weekend. And I, I'm like you, I sit there and I go, well, a weekend is just a, a different name <laughs> for workday yeah <laughs> now yeah you pretty much you travel non-stop i mean you're all over the place i'll, I'll tell you something I, I remember seeing on facebook this I, I guess it was a vertebrate paleontology meeting maybe that was in um uh, canada not too long ago yeah that was the last, yeah yeah was some there. some very good friends of mine were were just going crazy because you stopped by to look at some of the bones that they're working on i think he's working on a young allosaurus and and a tyrannosaurus oh rex. yeah 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 and yeah. and they they were going nuts and i was laughing because i said that's so funny because on my list of people that i'm dying to interview you were on there so i went well you know what I know he's going back home after that, probably. So that'd be a good time to contact you. When I contacted you, I think you were in China the the next week or something. Is that is that no, right? It was, it was it was South Africa. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> oh, only there. Yeah. Oh, only to yeah. South Africa. Well, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so sadly, I haven't been to China for for about five years now. It's, it, whereas it used to be a stomping ground of mine. Um, yeah, so I, I do travel a lot, but actually, yeah, again, it's actually primarily for my teaching. Um, the university that I'm at, we run two major field courses for our undergraduates. One of them I run to Canada, and that is actually dinosaur-based. We go to Dinosaur Provincial Park in Alberta. Uh, and the other one, actually, we go down to South Africa uh, to look at the ecology of large mammals, which actually is another little side thing of mine. Um, so although, yes, wonderful, I get a trip to Canada and South Africa every summer, it really chews my time up. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm teaching, you know, I'm, I'm teaching in the semesters and grading papers and exams. And then in the summer, I'm actually teaching again. Um So, yeah, it is at one level, it's great fun. And in this case, yeah, it gave me the opportunity to get to SVP in Calgary, which normally I wouldn't be able to do, but I was already in Alberta. So actually, that was a real bonus for me. Um, But yeah, again, it's uh, (laughs) um, more, just more stuff to try and (laughs) not not that I should, not that I don't enjoy it. Um, But yeah, certainly some of my colleagues kind of going, oh, you know, another holiday to South Africa. And it's like, it is amazing. (laughs) But we had we had 30 students you know it's a lot of work as well it's, yeah. it's not like I'm just it's not like i'm just sitting around watching the giraffe for three weeks <laughs> and being paid for the privilege yeah well it's it's like i pe- pe- tell people about my job if it wasn't for the hours and the pay it'd be a great job be right yeah, <laughs> yeah well, basically that. <laughs> one of the uh, one of the things that i am most impressed about the work that that you do 
is the amount of effort you put in to outreach where you're trying to take all this information that that you know and that you're learning and that other people uh, I've shared with you and you're reaching out to the general public two two questions one why do you think that's important to do and two how on earth do you have time to include you keep saying on this side I do this on how many sides do you have <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, yeah. And so in answer to the, the second one, I don't know. And to be honest, I, I have actually scaled back in recent years. I, I don't do as much as I used to. And indeed, I don't do as much as I like because I'm just too busy with other things. Right. Um, so, I mean, my uh, my blog, The Arkansas Musings, which has now been going 10 years, there was a long period of four or five years on that where I was probably posting five times a week. And now it's about a post a month. So, you know, the, the drop off there is absolutely colossal, um, partly because I lack the time, also partly to a degree, because there's a lot of stuff now I've written about. Right. And when you've written, you know, something like 10,000 articles, you start to run out of things to talk about. <laughs> you, find, you find you're repeating yourself a bit. Um, partly I have other avenues. So I wrote a book last year and I have a blog for the Guardian newspaper. Well, the Guardian newspaper's online section, obviously. Um, so I do have other venues which which does make a difference um but yeah in, in terms of the time yeah I, I wish i had more um the first question how um why do i think it's important i i think it's absolutely critical certainly you know there are there are small fringe benefits i think it's honed my you know my speaking skills and my communicating skills i'm i'm better at it um, I think, uh, you know, and all manner of things, you know, my teaching, my research writing, you know, all these different things that come through the fact that I spend a lot of my time communicating. Um, but it, I think it's just something that scientists sh should almost be honor bound to do. I mean, certainly in the UK, though, of course, I, I'm actually a bit of an exception. You know, the vast majority of our research is funded by the public, you know, ultimately it comes from taxation, money goes to the government, the government dishes it out to researchers and research go and do science. Well, if the general public paid for that science, you should damn well tell them what they got for their money. Um, so I think that's a really critical aspect of it. But just regardless, it's it's really important. Um, I'd like the world to be well educated. I'd like the world to be interested in science and see its value and encouraging and just generally enhancing that for people, I think is a strong duty. Um, I don't think everyone should necessarily do it because not everyone is really geared to doing it or even necessarily likes it. And certainly not everyone does have the time. Um, but I certainly don't see any reason why you know, any scientist should not commit at least a little bit of their career to doing a little bit of outreach at some point. Right. Well, I, I can tell you on, on behalf of, of somebody that has always loved science and always loved paleontology, it's people like you that motivate people like me and generations of people that you have may, you may have never met who you may have encouraged to do something to support the sciences because Unfortunately, at least here in the United States, um, there seems to be this division between science and society as if society doesn't understand all the things that science does. And so I yeah. love the fact that there are people like you that are bridging that gap and, and welcoming people in. I guess that's the point that I'm trying to make is we sometimes get the feeling and we meaning somebody like me that's not a degreed paleontologist that hasn't done all the things that you do. Sometimes people on the outside can feel like they're on the outside, but there's yeah. people like you and Dr. Larry Whitmer and, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Tom Holtz and a lot of these folks are sort of the bridge between that. And it does so much positive. I, you probably will never meet a quarter of the people that you impact, but someday there's going to be a young doctor, this person, because of the work that you did in all of your spare time <laughs> to try to motivate them. So I just want to publicly tell you how much I appreciate people like you and what you do. Well, well, thank you. Just as you know, the people that you mentioned, I mean, Larry is a phenomenal communicator and you, you ask how I find the time Tom Holtz is oh. frankly insane. My, my Twitter feed and Facebook feed is seems to mostly consist of Tom Holtz doing stuff. I don't think he's doing, he's got a, he built a robot. I know he did. Yeah. He's, yeah. He, I'm, there must be more than one of him. There it's, is. 
he's he's been i've been chasing that guy for for two years trying to get him to 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 get on my show i was fortunate enough to have dr whitmer on and uh i've been chasing dr holtz but i don't i don't push very hard because i know what these people's lives are i was stunned you were able to fit me in knowing what all you've been up to so yeah i i'm i know holtz had to have created a, a robot that just posts for him he probably doesn't even check facebook or or twitter anymore yeah. he doesn't even know it exists so you know yeah, that, that would explain a lot <laughs> <laughs> he looks like somebody that would build a, he looks like he's on the verge of being a mad scientist like <laughs> you, you just you just you know that he there's not it won't take much for him to to you know become even more insane than he is now and i i've met him on a number of occasions so i speak out of absolute love for the man <laughs> yeah he 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 is, a, he is a lot of fun I, I don't get to see tom half as often as i'd like uh, but yeah <laughs> he is good <laughs> well let's talk about your work in particular your work with um things like behavior um first can you sort of lay out for us how someone could even begin to hypothesize about the behavior of an animal that is let's let's pick one and let's let's pick everybody's favorite tyrannosaurus rex just sort of as a, as a focus how yeah. do you begin to to come up with your ideas uh, of their behavior and what a day in the life was like for them how do you how do you do that um I, well, I think there's a number of different routes into trying to work out what any given species were doing or any cluster of species were doing. Um, but I, th I think that the short version is to remember that, um, or think of behavior as it like this is absolutely, or the, the realm of possibility of behavior as this, you know, absolutely kind of enormous sphere with what the animal actually did somewhere in the middle. You know, the range of possibilities are absolutely colossal you know it, it for any unknown species but even t-rex you know however silly it sounds you know maybe it climbed trees maybe it's dived for fish maybe it actually ate plants uh, maybe it lived in huge herds of thousands maybe it lived its entire life on its own except for a day every 20 years when it mated you know there is such a range of possibilities from what we know of animals alive um, and what they could do and therefore really it's about cutting down that sphere of possibilities and all these different options in all these different directions down to get as close to the the true core as possible and some of those are quite easy it's fairly easy to demonstrate that t-rex couldn't possibly climb trees because it's got tiny little arms and the trees weren't really big enough for six and seven ton carnivores to go running around in them that gets rid of something you know it probably couldn't dive it shows none of the adaptations towards diving or fish eating that gets rid of some and all of these different things and you can actually start lopping off huge chunks of possibilities you know it took seconds for the first people who looked at t-rex to go well it's a carnivore um and that's not you know to, to kind of um play down that or make it sound silly but the fact that that's what that's actually built on is a piece of reasonable logic based on what we know about anatomy um carnivorous animals on average tend to have big sharp pointy teeth often with serrations there's always exceptions you know pandas are they're not exclusively herbivorous as people think but they are certainly mostly herbivorous they are not major carnivores they're not they're, they're omnivores, but on the vegetarian side of things, you know, so there are the odd exception. But, you know, you know there is a very good rule of thumb that anything with teeth like a T-Rex is a carnivore. And therefore, when you look at a T-Rex or indeed Allosaurus or Spinosaurus or whatever else, you know, these are clearly carnivorous animals. You can get down a fair amount. We can start looking at things like the limb bones. You know, yes, the arms are tiny, but the legs aren't. The legs are actually really quite long. They're also looking at things like muscle scars. We can show that they're really quite well muscled. Um, if we look at the unusual shape of, of the foot that Tyrannosaurus has, um, this has features which suggest that it was very efficient. That doesn't mean it's necessarily fast, but it's good at traveling long distances. Um, and then it's also something which is probably never going to be that quick because it's, you know, and a big adult is six, seven tons probably. So it's an animal that wasn't necessarily that quick, which was a good long distance runner. OK, so let's flip on to animal behavior. Almost every carnivore that we know of basically gets hold of its prey 
by either ambushing it, by getting very close and a very, very short sprint. So things like cheetah or actually things like a praying mantis or things like an octopus, or they just go a very long distance. They're, they're what we call pursuit predators and they hunt things down by basically keep going and being a better long distance runner, wolves, hyena, hunting dogs, and a whole bunch of things like this. And well, T-Rex really has the anatomy of a long distance runner, and it really doesn't have the anatomy of an animal that can hide and then sprint a short distance to be an ambusher. It's, you know, five, four, four meters high. This is not an animal that hides. Right. There's right. really only one conclusion at this point, and that is it was probably, probably a long distance pursuit predator. That's what the anatomy tells us. That's what our pattern of understanding of um, behavior tells us. Um, that's what it did. See, that I find that amazing because, you know, a, a, an investigator who's investigating a crime starts with what's there and works backwards. But you start with the anatomy of the animal and then work forward, right? Yeah, I, th I think there's there's a bit of both sides. Um, it always going to depend on exactly what data you've got, because that's the thing. You know, T-Rex, we've got a lot of T-Rex. You know, we've got lots of good specimens in good condition. We have a really good understanding of its fauna and what animals were living alongside it. We've got records of bite marks uh, and footprints and all of these things. And so you can build a bigger and bigger and bigger picture. But for a lot of things, of course, we have very, very little data. Uh, and the other problem we have, actually, ironically, is a lot of the time we don't have a great understanding of what living animals are doing uh, or certainly at least what patterns of behavior living animals have. If, if you're a guy working out in, well, for South Africa, you know, I actually now through my job know some guys working in South Africa and looking at the behavior of things like lions. If they want to know what a lion is doing and how it's acting, they follow it. They put tags on it and they send drones after it and they follow it around. And they look at what kills it's made and this, that and the other. And if they want to do that for a hyena, they go and follow a hyena or a jackal or whatever else. Very few people in animal behavior sit down and try and work out what are the things that make a lion hunt this way? And what are the things that make a hyena hunt that way, let alone a buzzard or a Komodo dragon or a chameleon or any of the other possible large predators. Uh, not that a chameleon is very, very large in the grand scheme of things. It's certainly bigger than insects. And so no one is actually sitting down and working out these huge patterns, which might give you an information which you can then apply to the fossil record. So actually, at least in some cases, my job is kind of twofold in that if I want to work out the behavior of a fossil animal, to a certain degree, I've got to work out what the patterns of behavior are in living animals. The data is often there, but no one's tried to pull it together yet. So you're actually trying to pull together all these disparate strands of understanding of behavior. And then when you understand what that pattern is, then you can see if you can apply it to things like, well, T-Rex actually has the anatomy of a pursuit predator, not an ambush predator. So you are using on one half of your equation, the anatomical um, build of an animal and all of the fossil evidence you have access to. And then you're using modern animals to sort of bridge the gap between time. And so when you make your announcements of what you believe an animal is behaving like, you didn't just pull that out of the sky. You've done a lot of research and comparative research to be able to come up with a relatively realistic thing even though we've never seen a tyrannosaurus rex you can formulate a reasonable explanation with science behind it it's not just you saying like you said i think they can climb trees yeah um yes that's true though i'd, I'd say that actually probably the major theme of my behavioral research in the last few years has been saying that actually we don't really know as much as we think we do um, for a lot of things. Um, so <laughs> I've been arguably less building up our knowledge and more pointing out that there are some real flaws or gaps in our knowledge that we didn't think were there and actually probably are. Um, so I suspect we actually know less with less confidence about a lot of behavior in dinosaurs than has often been said. 
And at one level, that sounds really negative, you know, kind of like pulling down knowledge and, you know, saying we've made mistakes. But, you know, that's a core part of science. If we're massively overconfident and mistakenly so about some things, building new hypotheses on, you know, crumbling or unstable scientific foundations will only lead to more errors and understanding you know, what we've done and what that means and what we can do with it is obviously incredibly important because that then allows you to step up um, and try and do more things better in the future. But what a brilliant way to explain to young people, especially for you young people listening or watching on YouTube. This is an example of what science is. Science isn't a club where everybody's in and they all sit around and they all agree or they all disagree. That's not the case. Here we have an example of Dr. Hone who's explaining that the, he, he just explained the, the point of science and that is to always be searching for truth as more information comes. So I applaud you for doing that. And, and that's the, the, the crux of science. And that's where I think people make a mistake about science because they sometimes believe that scientists all sit down and they're like a cheering section. And I've tried to tell them there is as much competition in science as there is on a football field. The only difference is most of the scientists don't break their collarbones during debates. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's probably happened occasionally. <laughs> I, I, I have I have honestly heard of literal fist fights breaking out at, at some conferences uh, in the biological sciences. Um, I've definitely seen some really quite, uh, let's say, vigorous debate and exchanges <laughs> of views between colleagues. Um, <laughs> but that's good for science, though. I mean, not the physical stuff. But yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I, I think I think occasionally when it gets that far, it's you know there's a there's a there's a bit of a myth that um, you know scientists love to be wrong, um, and certainly scientists like the answer to be correct. But we're also human. No one likes being wrong. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I have been wrong. I've got stuff completely wrong, and I am glad that we now have the right answer. Uh, I'm not exactly happy that someone pointed out that I'd made a mistake <laughs> or that I didn't know what I, I didn't know what I was doing when I thought I did. Um, so yeah, it's, th there are, there are heroic tales of magnanimous scientists <laughs> thanking colleagues for pointing out their errors. Um, I suspect those are, or the, the true magnanimous magnanimity, um, is very rare and often it's very crunchy. <laughs> um, but but it, but there is both sides of it. You know, I think people are genuinely happy. OK, we're now more on the right track than we were last year. Right. Um, but yeah, at the same time, I don't think anyone really likes to be wrong. Oh, that's, um, that's why I run my own company so that yeah, nobody can tell me I'm wrong. And if yeah, I am wrong, I look around yeah. and go, who's the idiot that came up with this idea? And I went, oh, I know who it is. So <laughs> and I, think, I think that's where some of that comes from is, you know, if, if you've invested years of your work into an idea and it looks like you probably got it wrong you can understand why people are very reluctant to let that go and sure. will continue to defend it sure. um and and actually an, another aspect that's, that's worth bringing up of that is actually a lot of good can come from this so you know paleontologists you know scientists in any field they get frustrated by you know outdated ideas that resurrect or things that were you know literally disproved years or decades ago still kind of clinging on but actually it can generate really important new research because people you know last hangers on and defenders of these ideas you know that it's it's exceptionalism they go well all of that data may completely disapprove my idea but have you thought of this and actually people then come along and go no i hadn't thought of that let's see if that works as well and it starts a whole new line of research, uh, which, which almost without exception continues to prove that they were completely wrong. But it <laughs> generates a ton of new data. Well, and that's good for science. Right. Well, I, I know that um, uh, one of the things that I notice a lot, and now this is usually driven by the media, not by the scientists themselves. Seems like every new discovery always has some smashing headline like bigger than Tyrannosaurus Rex or uh, biggest yeah. dinosaur in the world. 
And then about a month later, you see this tiny little retraction that, well, actually, it was 24 feet short of a Tyrannosaurus Rex. And you go, how the hell did you ever... You don't see the retractions, to be honest. Right. But I know that's got to be frustrating for scientists because... You know, the media is trying to to blow this stuff up and hype it. And it sort of leaves the paleontologist in this limbo of I didn't say that. I never said I, I remember one time there's a paleontologist here in Texas, um, Juan Langston. Uh, oh, yeah, I know one. Ah, neat. Well, new, new, new one right. who's, who died of four or five years ago. Yeah, now, it, it was. Well, I was sitting there talking to him once interviewing him. And we got on the subject of how frustrating it is. And he made the perfect statement. He said, I don't mind defending the things I've said. I just hate to have to defend the things I didn't say. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's yeah, that's a very, very good point. Um, and I think that that kind of thing is is very true. Um, and, it, and it comes from a number of different ways in my experience. So it, it comes from you know, just excessive hype. People are just right. so desperate for something to be something that there's, there can be, it, it, yeah, I think it's, let me just want to get this right. I, I think it is rarely actively dishonest of the media to end up saying the things that they do. Every so often that there is some real dishonesty where a quote is very selectively edited or deliberately taken out of context. Right. Um, but I think the vast majority of the time the, these errors come about is the fact that information is often like second or third hand. I've seen this myself. You know, I, I have a good paper coming out and I contact my university's, um, you know, outreach de- department or the, the effectively the PR arm and they want to put out a press release and go and contact the media. And I sit and talk on the phone to someone for half an hour who is, you know, really a media person. They're not a paleontologist. They probably have no background in science. And yesterday they were dealing with the history department or the law department or the Spanish department. Um, And they need to try and understand what I've told them that I've spent several years doing, which I think is, you know, frontier breaking or extremely interesting. And then they have to write a version of that that they think will both appeal to and is a clear explanation of what was happening to the media they then send that out to the media and a journalist if they pick it up may then rewrite that possibly with my paper possibly with speaking to me but again even a science journalist the idea that they have a background in dinosaur behavior is extremely unlikely and then that will go to a sub editor and maybe even a senior editor who will edit it without having seen my paper so you can imagine how after you know kind of chinese whispers of three and four steps away from the original with each person putting their own spin on it and trying to put it in a certain way, phrases get mangled, rewritten, numbers get rounded up and rounded up again and rounded up again. And, you know, maybe they've tried to compare it to something. So they've gone, okay, well, just how big was this thing? He said it's bigger than that species. So they just Google for that species and pull the first number they find on the internet because they've got to get this thing online within 30 minutes. That's often the case with with cutting edge um, science. It has to be on, you know, from the guy's desk, from the time he hears about it until the time it is live on the Internet, 30 minutes. You think he's got time to fact check? You think he's got a time to read a paper that's 20 pages long of a field he's never studied um, and double check his sources? No. And I have sympathy with that. And then someone else comes along and edits it after him. Right. So, <laughs> well, the- you you can see how mistakes get made. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't often hold these people to better account than we do, and doubly so where it's something that's supposed to be authoritative, like a documentary, where it's a considered piece in something like New Scientist or National Geographic, where these guys do have days or weeks to write pieces, not hours or even minutes um so yeah i think there is a lot of bad science communication or let's say imperfect science communication from an awful lot of the media i have a sympathy with a lot of it but that doesn't mean it couldn't be considerably better right well i know the headlines for this interview for us is going to be dr david hone proves tyrannosaurs were arboreal yeah because that's uh, <laughs> That's what we all yeah. picked up from this. <laughs> yeah, and you you see stuff like that. Um, you know, not not far off. Um, well, uh, yeah, and the, you know, and and, and you know, let's let's face it. You know, the media are again because 
you know, even a science journalist doesn't have the background, et cetera, et cetera. You know, they can be hoodwinked. Right. Um, you know, very spurious pieces of work do come out and will make their way onto their desk. I have definitely seen cases of what I've called, you know, science by press release. Right. Um, where you, you, you see this article by, by a journalist, you know, describing this amazing new piece of research. And then you go and read the paper and find that they're completely different and have no bearing on each other at all. Right. And a couple of times I've dug down and got hold of the press release that the university or the researcher put out. And yeah, I, the journalist did a very good job of writing up what he was sent, but it wasn't what the original scientific study said. Wow. That's, um, that's got to be frustrating. Well, yeah. Um, and the thing to remember is, and again, with you know your, your audience, kids pick up on this. Um, I, you know, I have lost count. You know, I, I do outreach for everything from kind of five-year-olds up to, you know, pensioners and retirees. Right. Um, and the number of times you either get from kids or actually even adults who said, my, car, my child asked me to ask you this. And it is a line repeated from some documentary um, or even actually straight out of a film, you know, which is clearly supposed to be fiction. Right. And it's just taken as fact. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've been involved in a number of TV shows um, behind the scenes, rarely on camera. Um, people say, well, we just want to say this. I mean, you can't say that. It's just not true. And they went, well, but someone said it once and it might be true. And it's like, you can't say it. It's just not true. You do right. not have evidence to support that statement. And lo and behold, it still appears in the show because it's a, quote, great line and no one will remember it. And six months later, I will be told by a child in complete earnestness, oh, well, of course, this does this. This species did that. Right. If I hear one more uh -huh. time that if you stood still, a Tyrannosaurus Rex can't see you. Yeah. Oh, my God, that drives me up the wall. I'm like standing still would just make it easier for him to eat you as he walked by. <laughs> mm. but, there, but there, at least, it's fiction and you can understand the. Sure. You can understand that not everyone gets the blurring, let's right. say, or the or the idea that it's, you know, fiction has crept in more than you might think. But when there are, you know, straight up front, this is a documentary. We spoke to paleontologists and they told us to tell you this. Right. And what they tell you is flat wrong. Yeah. And I told them it was wrong multiple times. Right. Um I, I don't know what you can do at that point it's other than be very unhappy about it's, it. It's doctor shopping. They'll find somebody to say what they want, even if it's a doctor of theology, as long yeah. as it says doctor in front of their name, and then they'll just regurgitate what they're told. You know, it, it's it's frustrating, but, you know, I guess it's all it's all part of the game. Now, let me, let me ask you something. I don't know if you've spent much time um, with the Ceratopsians, but I've always oh. been fascinated as to what your opinion would be about those animals. Now, now clearly there's places where evidence suggests that they at least died together. Like, like mm -hmm. uh, what's Pipestone Creek, for instance. Um, yeah. Where, where that, that seems from my point of view, very clear evidence that they all died at the same time, which would then lead me to, to assume that they live together. Have you done any research on any of the Ceratopsians? And if so, what is your, how do you think those animals behave? Were they herding or were they individual? What do, what do you well, think? So, so this is exactly the kind of stuff I was talking about before in terms of, you know, we're working out what, what we really do know. And certainly lots of people have said ceratopsians were herding animals. Um, and look at these, you know, these big mass mortality sites where we've got 100, 200, maybe a few thousand animals together in some cases. And my answer is no, we don't know that at all. First of all, I'd say it's extraordinarily dangerous to extrapolate across a very big group and say something is universal when it comes to behavior. You know, monkeys and apes and primates generally absolutely do not like swimming, except for those macaque species, which happily spend 
most of their time in water and can swim brilliantly. Um, you know, uh, cats are solitary animals that live on their own, well, apart from lions and apart from cheetahs. And dogs are animals that always live in groups and hunt together, apart from maned wolves and bush dogs. It, it doesn't matter what you come up with. As soon as you have a group of more than half a dozen species, inevitably one of them does something a bit weird that the others don't do. So I'm always extremely skeptical of, you know, the ceratopsians were herding. You know, even, you know, we've, we're up to about 120 species now, Ceratopsian. Wow. Oh, no, no, that's, that's probably very high. Sorry, that's about 60 or so. Yeah, sorry, that was a horrible estimate. Um, but the idea that every single one of those was herding, and even if they were herding, herding in the same way, I think is extremely unlikely. Um, for a start, we've got some decent evidence that Triceratops probably didn't. Um, so, for example, I think we've yet to find any group of Triceratops together. Wow. There's wow. in the realm of 150, maybe even 200 good specimens of Triceratops now, and they're always found on their own. We never find groups of them. We do find groups of juvenile Triceratops. In fact, every record, I think, of juveniles that we have is from a group. So it really looks like the juvenile triceratops hung around together, but the adults were solitary. Um, so there, are, there already we've got, A, a change in behavior as animals grow, but also a huge difference between triceratops, which appears at least to be solitary as an adult, and then things like, yeah, Centrosaurus and Pachyrhinosaurus, where we regularly find them in, in big groups. But even when we do find... Lots of ceratopsians in big groups, lots of hadrosaurs we find in big groups and various other things. I think it's quite dangerous to necessarily say that they actually lived in groups because, again, lots of animals shift their behavior as they grow or over the years. Wildebeest, you know, everyone loves watching, you know, every wildlife documentary ever has the wildebeest migration in, in you know, uh, Kenya and, and Tanzania, you know, a million animals going across the plains. That's actually quite an unusual thing for them. Most of the time, they're all spread out across the um, savannah, and they're all hanging around in little family groups of half a dozen each. And then several times a year, they basically come into this enormous aggregation and move from the area where there isn't a lot of grass to the area where there is a lot of grass. And then a few months later, they come back again. So that migration of thousands and millions of animals is a relatively small part of their life. And yet, it's the one thing we always see on the TV, so it's what we think they do. But also, when are they going to die in large numbers? Lions are eating them all the time, hyenas are eating them all the time, but when they cross the river, hundreds of them drown. And I think if you fast forwarded half a million years as a future paleontologist and dug down to the extinct wildebeest of the early 20th century, you'd say, wow, these things had lived in herds of hundreds of thousands. Everywhere we dig in these riverbeds, we turn up hundreds of them together, sometimes thousands of them together. They must have lived in enormous herds. And the fact is, well, they do, but only for a little part of the time. And if you go to South Africa, where the same species lives, it's the same species as in, as in Kenya and Tanzania, they live on their own or in groups of, you know, five to 20. There's, the weather system is not such a big deal that they don't migrate. So they never live in big herds. And yet it's the same species living at the same time. So just because there's a giant mass mortality or even 10 or 20 groups that we now know of something like Centrosaurus, I think it's dangerous to say actually Centrosaurus lived in a group. And I think it's very dangerous to say um, Ceratopsians lived in groups because actually I don't know if we really can say that with any degree of confidence. And this actually goes back to the point I made earlier about, you know, how much we actually don't know about living systems. It may turn out that actually if we look very carefully at the size of an animal and what kind of food it eats and what the local weather systems are like and how productive the environment are and where the predators are, maybe there's actually a very strong correlation between these things and whether or not animals live in groups. And if there is, we can use that to go back to our dinosaur data and say, okay, do we really think these things lived in groups the whole time or only some of the time or maybe it was different in different places at different times? 
But currently, I'd say we do not have that level of understanding to say anything with that degree of confidence. That's absolutely brilliant. I'll tell you the truth. I have I have lived my adult life making an assumption because of mass mortality that that then was the proof of what I thought without ever giving any thought to exactly what you said. Yes, those animals died together at that moment, but does that moment reflect their entire life or does that mo- I guess it's sort of the same thing with with birds that are migrating. You see tens yeah. of thousands of birds together, so your immediate response would be they that's what they do every day of their life. That's what they yeah. live in. But when they get to where they're going, they disperse and the next thing you know, you see a Canadian two. goose here or two over yeah. there and it isn't 10 million. That is amazing. I hope as many of the listeners had their eyes opened up to that as you just opened mine to what I believed all of my adult life, making an assumption off of a off of a single frame of a of a history of an animal off of a single moment of time that then represented what they do. That is pretty amazing. Well, to, you know, to, to defend you from that, I, I think it's something that's, you know, really quite common in the scientific literature. I think a lot of, you know, professional academics and paleontologists have tended to make that same mistake. Um, and that's that's part of, I think, the problem we talked about kind of, you know, dodgy foundations in places. Um, now, the, the, the flip side of that is not to say that none of these things lived in groups. Sure. Um, and I'm sure some of them did. In fact, I'm sure lots of them did. And we've probably got the ones that did on on average, we're probably finding them in groups more often. Centrosaurus is probably a very good candidate for an animal that did live in groups a lot of the time. But I don't know just how confident we can really be that that's actually true from based on, again, what we see the patterns of living species. There is absolutely enormous variation out there um, between groups and even within groups and even within species and even within, you know, for single animals over their lifetime or even on a on a yearly basis. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, the, the classic one is, you know, pack hunting in various theropods but in particular dromaeosaurs like velociraptor and deinonychus and to a lesser degree in the tyrannosaurs and yeah almost all of the actual evidence that there is for this alleged pack hunting is a couple of times we found some groups of them together and there's a lot of reasons that animals come together um and it's not just because they're living together they can migrate together they may indeed hunt together they might have come together to breed they might have come together because there's a you know water crisis and they're all going the same way because they're trying to get to the water hole um you know there are plenty of reasons and and sometimes animals just do weird things again speaking to my colleague in south africa who's a large mammal ecologist and apparently recently down there there was a there was a terrible drought about 18 months ago, one of the worst South Africa has experienced in, in something like 50 years. And a report to, came to a friend of his. OK, this is third hand information now, but I kind of <laughs> trust him and I kind of trust his colleagues when he says my friend saw this. Um, there was a group of leopards apparently hunting together. Now, leopards are famous not just for being solitary cats but basically being antisocial cats other than a few days of the year where the females are receptive leopards basically just attack each other on sight and the fact that there's a group of them hunting together and acting as a pack is absolutely incredible and it shows you just how flexible the behavior of animals can be um that you know animals that are notorious for being solitary and even you know aggressive to the point of antisocial can under the right circumstances go right switching up it's it's time to be a group wow that's just that's fascinating I, well that's it's, just, it's, it's it's mostly a nightmare for trying to oh, work out what earth animals were doing how many times do you take a big stack of papers you wrote and just shove them into the trash can because a group of leopards decided to act different <laughs> Well, I, I, I try and avoid it. And of course, that, that's indeed why you want to look at as much data as possible from as many species as possible. Right. Um, yeah. And you also, uh, you know, you kind of flip it both ways. I say, you know, there are always these exceptions. And I guess I'm therefore perhaps a little overcautious that I'm always sitting there thinking, well, this could be an exception. This could be an exception. This could be an exception. Right. And, and it could be. 
But if, to be honest, if the exceptions are rare, on average, you're probably guessing right when you find, yeah, lots of big groups together. Um, but again, I'd still be very careful. Again, the Centrosaurus example, even if we're dead right, and yeah, the reason that we find lots of multiple beds of Centrosaurus together is because they really did live in herds. That doesn't mean that other individuals didn't and no. that they weren't effectively solitary, you right. know, and different animals live in different places. So a major phenomenon we get among um, basically antelope and, and, and deer and various animals like this, l- large herbivores, is a, is a thing called bachelor herds. And these are basically all the young males so, you know, you, you will typically have one male with a group of females called the harem living together and the female have their babies and any female stay in the group and any males sooner or later get kicked out by the big guy. And when they do, they all get together. All the young males who've been kicked out of every other group basically join together because they're vulnerable to predators living on their own. So they want to live in a big group where they can look out for each other. And none of them are big enough to take over a herd yet and challenge one of the big males, but they want to try and stay alive long enough. And so actually, if you look at the adult animals of a population, almost all the females live in a group with the odd male and all the males live in a group. And this is really relevant because if you go and find a big group like, say, Centrosaurus or there's a famous big bed of Albertosaurus, the Tyrannosaur and things like this, there's often an assumption that, well, most animals are about 50, 50 male and female. And we've dug up, you know, 30, 40, 50 animals. So there's probably 25 males and 25 females there. And why isn't that 50 males? Why isn't that just a big bachelor herd? Or why isn't that just a really big harem? And there's one male in there somewhere and everything else is a female. Um, And the other problem is, of course, is that often the bachelor males are trying to stay out the way of the big males, which means they're probably living in different areas. And if you're living in a different place, you've probably got a different chance of being preserved as a fossil. Right. If big males are hanging around the rich food areas, that's probably where there's lots of water. Where there's lots of water, there's mud and rivers and floodplains and chances to get buried. Where there isn't is probably in the uplands where there's little of that. So, in fact, maybe it's very hard for males to be preserved and it's very easy for females to be preserved. This could really skew what we think we're seeing when you get, yeah, something like Ghost Ranch in in. Texas, uh, New Mexico, New Mexico with, right. sorry, yeah, New Mexico with, with coelophysis, you know, there's 120, 130 individuals together. Um, and the general assumption is that there's going to be about 50, 50 males and females, but I don't see any particular reason that couldn't be a hundred percent one or a hundred percent the other. Wow. God. And it would be useful to know. Which. <laughs> right, right. Well, let me let me ask you this now in um, because you briefly touched about antelope. So one of the things that 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 we see a lot here in Texas is, um, of course, deer population and, and and people bringing in exotic animals and the horn configuration of the males from what I can see with modern animals is used as much of a display if not more of a display than um than strictly for weapons with looking at things like some of the ceratopsians or even the ankylosaurus who seem to have huge spikes that you know from from an outside looking in you immediately assume well those are all defensive do you think that either of those species that the horns played more of a role than just weapons do do you think they were used as a way to maybe display their age or oh yeah yeah absolutely i i I wrote a paper on this a um a couple of years ago actually with a with a student of mine um so one of the things in fact i've written a series of papers on kind of this kind of display and communication so one of the key things that we do see this is actually a pattern we really understand well one of the things we do see with animals that have what are called secondary sexual characteristics. So these are things that only appear basically when they are ready to reproduce are, is that they grow very, very fast. Uh, and I think people kind of know this intuitively. And then when you explain it, 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 it kind of, Oh yeah, yeah. That, that's exactly what I'd have, have thought of. You look at say a baby cow or a, or a baby sheep, a lamb, 
and they look cute and they kind of look like the adults, but they don't have horns. And they get to about half the size of the adult and they look a bit more adult like they've kind of lost the gangly limbs and the giant eyes but they still don't have horns and they get to three quarters of the size of the adult. And now they really look like an adult, but just a little bit smaller. And maybe they've got the nubs of horns and then they reach full size and suddenly the horns go and you've got these enormous things just appear on the top of their heads, like almost overnight within weeks or months. Um, And that's basically growing very, very fast, very late in the animal's growth. The animal gets almost to adult size and then suddenly these things go nuts. Um, And basically the correct (laughs) scientific description of this is called strong positive allometry. So basically they are growing faster than everything else. Um, And we see this in things like peacock feathers and tusks in elephant and yeah, horns in antelope and you name it, long tails in barn swallows and anything else you might want to name that we actually often have a good understanding are used in some kind of sexual display like a peacock or sexual conflict like deer and antelope. We actually also see at least in one ceratopsian, which is Protoceratops, the little one from Mongolia, which doesn't really have a horn but does have a big frill at the back of the neck. And basically me and my student, we got hold of pretty much every known, actually photo mostly, but every known photo of a protoceratops that was available of every size. And we measured the eye and the jaw and the head and the frill and a couple of other features. And we were basically able to show that the frill doesn't grow much when the animal's small. Other things are the jaw is growing, the head is growing, the eyes are growing. But then when it starts to get towards full size, the frill starts growing much faster. It shows strong positive allometry. And there, this is a feature that we basically only see in animals that are using these structures in some form of um, yeah, sexual display or sexual con- conflict or some kind of, you know, adult reproducing thing or something that is linked to being an adult. Wow. So the, the, there's one thing I've, I've, I really want to know this, this, I actually made a mental note because I, I wanted to make sure it seems like new discoveries are showing it, obviously a much closer relationship to birds with theropods birds mm-hmm. are it before the discovery of the colored pigments or, or the technology that can be used yeah. to find the colored pigments. Did you, based on your knowledge of modern animals, did you ever hypothesize before it became popular? Did you ever think color was a major part of dinosaurs. I mean, assuming now that you think color is a major part, did you ever think that before this evidence based on just, just your understanding of modern animals? Um, yeah, I, I absolutely did, but I certainly wouldn't try and take any credit for that. Cause I think a lot of people did. Ah. Um, there, there is no, the, the, the problem is, so this is something you get with, with paleontology a lot of the time. And this is where I think, um, often people writing about um, science, you know, not just paleo, though, of course, that's my primary experience, so that's where I'll draw from. But people writing about science don't understand the difference between what scientists probably know or think they know based on the available data and what they're actually comfortable with saying publicly. Because there is very little to write, you know, in terms of writing a technical scientific paper for your colleagues. It is very hard to write a paper going, well, dinosaurs were probably brightly coloured, weren't they? After all, lots of other animals are. And because that's about the limit of right. your argument. <laughs> it's, it's a little more nuanced than that. We can talk about what we know about colour vision of dinosaurs based on birds and reptiles. It was probably very good. We can talk about the relationships of birds to dinosaurs. We could say that crocodiles are a bit unusual, so maybe they're not a great model for colour. And all the lizards are very brightly coloured. And indeed, a lot of the turtles are brightly coloured. Um, a lot of mammals actually are more brightly coloured than people give them credit for, particularly the ones that see well in colour, like 
like primates. There are lots of primates with bright colored faces or indeed bright colored rear ends. Um, so color, you know, is a big thing for animals that are trying to display to each other. And I think most people would have agreed that, yeah, things like ceratopsians with their frills, things like hadrosaurs with their horns, maybe things like spinosaurs with their back spines were in some way, shape or form trying to communicate to each other. And if they're trying to communicate, color is a great way of doing this. But I don't think you have to be a real expert in animal behavior to have worked that out. So I think kind of everyone knew it, but no one said it. Because why would you say something that everyone knows and you know no one can prove? But then, of course, what happens is that, uh, you know, the first few papers come out on the melanosomes and colors and patterns. And immediately you start seeing comments on paleontology forums going oh well i worked that out years ago and apparently the scientists hadn't even noticed and it's like no no we knew we just didn't bother saying it because <laughs> we've, we've got nothing to say right. we really have nothing to say on this subject so it's really not worth it um and, uh, but you, you see an awful lot of that. And, and it's it's the difference between what you can say kind of yeah in, in a scientific publication versus what you think you know in your head or indeed what you can say in a book. Because, of course, the different, you know, having written a popular science book, there's a difference to what you can put in a book where you can just write, let's face it, whatever you want versus what I can write in a scientific paper where it's going to be critiqued by my colleagues and critiqued by referees and people can write a formal response. If I have an interesting idea, I can scribble that in a book very easily and go, you know what, guys, maybe this is true, but I really can't prove it right now. Whereas you literally can't write that in a scientific paper. It's by its definition almost unscientific. So there is this huge disparity between what scientists know and what they're prepared to put on the record professionally as a as a um, published scientific paper. Um, and that, I think, gets overlooked by an awful lot of people. And therefore, you, you do see... Um, either people thinking that scientists were ignorant of that or seeing other popular scientists or sorry, other popular science books not written by paleontologists going, well, this guy worked it out and the scientists didn't. And it's like, <laughs> actually, he's just said something that's been in kind of common knowledge for 50 years, right. <laughs> but wasn't in the scientific literature. And there's an enormous difference between the two. Wow. Well, speaking of books, there's a book called the Tyrannosaur Chronicles. You ever heard of it? Uh, yeah. I <laughs> strangely <laughs> enough. And I think we both know why. As well. yeah. <laughs> you authored that book, the Tyrannosaur Chronicles. And for everybody out there listening, you can find it on Amazon. You can find it in a lot of different places. This is a book you should go out and get. It's called the Tyrannosaur Chronicles. It is fast. It's one of the books that I have, as a matter of fact, right here in my, it's funny because it's right up in front of me in my, uh, here in the studio. It is a fascinating book. What motivated you to add author to your list of all the other things that you do? Um, to be honest, I'd, I'd always wanted to write a book. If, if I'm really honest, um, I'd, I'd always wanted to have written a book, which is not quite the same thing. Um, I always wanted to have a book on the shelf that I could point to and say, I wrote that. I'm not sure how keen I was on the actual process <laughs> of getting 90 odd thousand words down on the page and then getting it past the um, publishers. Um, but no, it, it was it was something that I'd always had in my mind, um, but I really didn't have the time literally the time to, to go and hunt down the opportunity to do it. Um, a number of my colleagues had written books and it was either because a publisher approached them and said, do you want to do X? Um, or in a number of cases, you know, they'd send email after email and draft chapter after draft chapter to a whole bunch of publishers and, you know, negotiated and argued and made a case and Da, 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 da. And like, I did not have the time for that. Right. So I was basically waiting for something to, to land on my desk. And as it happened, uh, as a result of writing to The Guardian, people saw what I was writing and that there was an audience and that I could write and they were interested. So they came to me. Well, it, however it happened, I'm glad it did because it's a great book. It's an easy read for the average person, which is very important. And that's not always the case with books written by professional scientists, sometimes the average person has trouble 
understanding some of the terminology. And so I I love the style you wrote the book because if you're a young person and I mean young, this is a great Christmas gift because Christmas is coming not too far away. A young person can still take away a tremendous amount, but the average adult who reads it will have a completely different point of view that you don't have from other books. So I absolutely love your book. I, I, I think it's a great book. I'm glad you wrote it. Well, thanks very much. I mean, it's, you know, I, I enjoyed doing it. I had a lot of fun doing it at, at times. at least. Um, and yeah, I, I, I tried to make it clear. Um, I actually had a bit of a row with the publishers because, you know, I have these kind of two or three introductory, mini introductory chapters at the start kind of talking about the basics of anatomy and actually systematics and how and why we classify things. Um, And they wanted that to be much more integrated into the text. But I know from my own experience, and I don't just mean teaching, I mean learning as an undergraduate when I was trying to learn this stuff myself, you think you know it. And then you go back to it or it pops up again a week or two later and you're like, I can't remember what that term means. I, I can't remember what that Oh, what was the exact explanation or the exact definition of that again? And I know that most people are not going to pick that book up and read it in one sitting. I know people who have, um, <laughs> but possibly more for them. But the vast majority of people, you'll read a couple of chapters in a night and maybe you'll read a chapter every day for a few weeks. But, you know, rarely will anyone get through it in anything less than a week. Right. And it means that something that you've introduced on page 17 that doesn't actually crop up again until page 45 and then again on page 200 they're not going to remember what it was and i've done this myself reading books and then you're hunting through the book trying to find the bit where it mentioned that thing that you now can't remember the definition of and i knew if i put them all at the front in their own little sections it was very easy to go ah well i know it was in that first couple of pages and then you just need to turn to the front and you'll you might have to hunt through the chapter, but at least you're hunting through five pages and not 50 and you should be able to find it. Um, so I, that was a that was a real intent on my part. And I hope it worked. Well, and that's a perfect example of why this book is good for anyone with any level of knowledge because of that, because it was written by somebody that is it's educational but educational, you don't need a degree to understand what it is you're saying. But when you finish reading it, you'll feel like you have a degree because it's written very well. And I think the majority of the people that read it will absolutely love it and probably read it three or four times and learn something new every time. Well, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. And I know it's late for you. You're kind enough to do this. For everybody out there, if you want to learn more about Dr. Hone, you go to his website. It's Dave Hone, one word, D-A-V-E-H-O-N-E dot C-O dot U-K. We'll put links to it on our podcast page. Dr. Hone, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time. And I'm still stunned because you've completely changed my viewpoint on ceratopsians. Honestly, you have. And I'm thrilled because it... You never want to get to the point where you're so locked in on an idea that you're not willing to accept another one. You have completely changed my entire (laughs) opinion of ceratopsians. Not that maybe my first opinion was right, but that you can't take a tiny bit of evidence and apply it with a paint roller over everything. So, yeah. I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope we can we can maybe interview you again as more things are discovered and as you release more papers. I would love to have you back. I hope you'd be willing to come back again because I I oh, think yeah, I know the people listening are going to absolutely love this and it is just it's fascinating. Well, no, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. It's been good fun. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And again, uh, go to his website, Dave Hone, D-A-V-E-H-O-N-E dot C-O dot U-K. Dr. Hone is a paleontologist and uh, who understands uh, anatomy or utilizes anatomy and modern animal behavior and the fossil record to help us have a better understanding about what prehistoric life was like. Go out and buy the Tyrannosaur Chronicles. Uh, Christmas is coming soon. Go out there and (laughs) make sure you beat your parents or your family or your husband or your wife and tell them that's the book that you want. And uh, Dr. Hone, again, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. 
No, thanks for having me. It's been good. All right. Well, that was the interview and uh, really interesting stuff. In fact, I had so much fun and I had, there was so much information we didn't have time to get to. Dr. Hone is nice enough to have agreed to come back on and he's going to do a follow-up interview dedicated to theropods, just theropods. We're going to talk about uh, the behavior, the hunting methods, the the family groupings. We're going to talk in much greater detail about the hunting methods of theropods. So he's nice enough to agree to do that. I suspect we'll probably record that in uh uh, in November, and I'll play it in November. So stay tuned for a lot of upcoming, uh, a lot of upcoming shows. Hey, listen. By the way, uh, we have a brand new website. We've just changed the website. It has a couple of little bugs that's still working out, but uh, I would invite you to go to dinosaurgeorge.com and take a look at the website. I think you'll like some of the changes. I think it's a much more appropriate look. My website has always been. I never been very happy with it, but I will say that I'm pretty happy with it now. At least it looks more modern. It doesn't look like like I built it because of the last one I built. So it doesn't look like that. So it's much more modern. So anyway, I hope you guys will go check it out and I hope you like it. Uh, if you're following me on uh, Facebook and Twitter, I appreciate it. If not, I hope you will. There are links on our website to both Facebook and Twitter. If you go to the very bottom of the homepage, uh, you'll see links and you can click on that. And I hope you guys will follow us on it. Um, for those of you listening on the podcast, thank you very much. And for those of you watching on YouTube, thank you guys very much as well. I appreciate it. And I hope you will share it and subscribe and, and pass the word around if you like the show. All right. Um, make sure to, like I said, to check out our new website, dinosaurgeorge.com. And while you're there, I hope you'll go to the catalog, which is store.dinosaurgeorge.com. By the way, I am now upgrading the podcast, which is... I think it's dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com. If it's not, if that's not the right thing, I know that there's a link uh, on our face. I mean, on our our website. So anyway, listen. Thank you guys so very much for tuning in and watching. I hope you enjoyed this one. Stay tuned for a bunch of new uh, podcasts that will be released during the months of November and December when I have some time off. So until then, thank you guys very much and take care, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. Until next time, keep digging for clues about the past. 